This is the fourth lecture in a series of eight lectures on the doctrine of Satan. And we're examining now some of the activities of Satan and how he loves to corrupt the Word of God by taking it out of context and by causing people to misunderstand and misinterpret it. And there are five illustrations that we're giving along this line by misunderstanding and misinterpreting the Bible. Some believe that a believer can lose his salvation or that he has to be baptized in water to be saved, that he must speak in tongues to get saved or to remain saved, and that all sick Christians are sinning somewhere along the line, and uh, finally that a Christian may achieve sinless perfection in this life on the basis of, among other verses, 1 John 3, 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his sin remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. We need to say this, that this is in the aorist tense here, and it simply means, uh, one of the explanations for it, that is, that uh, he does not habitually sin, continue in sin. But let me just say this, if the Bible did teach sinless perfection, which it does not, then for a person to claim it, is to claim more than the Apostle Paul himself claimed. I refer to a passage here in Philippians chapter 3 where Paul says that I might know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. Verse 12 of chapter 3, Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count myself not to have apprehended. I'm not perfect, Paul says, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind the failures of yesterday and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So the Bible does not teach sinless perfection on the basis of 1 John 3, 9, but the devil loves to misinterpret the word of God. All right, another thing he does now along this line, he loves to overstress one side of a doctrine and ignoring the other side. Of course, a classic example of this would be the doctrine of predestination. I, uh, I knew a student while I was attending the Moody Bible Institute some 24, 25 years ago, and he was a hyper-Calvinist, and I mean in the ultimate sense of the word. And well, he flunked English. And uh, he was telling everybody that he was predestined that he flunk English. And I told him, I said, you rascal, if you had, I said, I don't know much about, uh, you're a, a third year man and I just came. And I said, I don't know much about uh, the Bible at this point, but I do know this from living uh, in and uh, with you, uh, close to you for one semester and observing you, that if you had spent half the time, one-tenth of the time, in your room studying English as you did out here in the hallway arguing about predestination, you'd have made an A in it. But uh, bless his heart, his first name was Harvey, and Harvey was the type of fellow that would fall down uh, a flight of stairs and get up and brush himself off and say, thank God that's over with, you know, because he was predestined before the foundation of the world to, to uh, you know, to fall down that flight of stairs. Well, a number of preachers and, and uh, believers have gone off the deep end by overstressing uh, one side of this two-sided coin and completely ignoring the other side. Now, what about predestination? And when we start studying this in the Thomas Road Bible Institute, I uh, begin by saying, number one, we're not going to understand it. But I can, folks, and I point to the left side of the pulpit when I say this usually, I say, students, um, I could, uh, for the next 20 minutes, now quote to you scriptures in the Bible proving the doctrine of election, proving the doctrine of predestination. 
And I said, these scripture verses, I could stack them high till they reach the ceiling. And then, when you're absolutely convinced, I could begin quoting scriptures proving the responsibility of man. And these scriptures would likewise form another pile on the other side of the pulpit, equally as high as the verses on predestination, the sovereignty of God. The truth of the matter is the Bible stresses, the Bible emphasizes both the sovereignty of God and the responsibility of man. Now, it is impossible for the finite mind to reconcile these. There are some principles that are above human reasoning. They are not unreasonable, but they are above human reasoning. The Trinity, for example, the three in one, or the concept of eternity. Now, you cannot comprehend that. You can, perhaps, if you really think about it, comprehend faintly uh, everlasting or something with no end but you cannot comprehend something with no beginning. And yet the Bible teaches the eternality of God and the trinity of God. So the devil enjoys doing this, though, and, and uh, uh, of all the... We very, very seldom have trouble with students in the Institute, the Thomas Road Bible Institute. God sends us truly some choice men from all over the world, and I only had to ask, I think, two, maybe three, and I really didn't demand that they leave. I just sort of suggested that they did. And the hundreds and hundreds of students that have uh, it's been my privilege to teach since coming to Thomas Road in 1950, or 1972, rather. One was because of his involvement in the tongue movement, and uh, he felt not only should he speak in tongues, but he was uh, called upon, and this was a mission field, and he was called upon to be a missionary in our church to get all the other students to speak in tongues, and of course we had to encourage him to leave. And the other one uh, was uh, a man that, a uh, good student, but he was, uh, he overstressed, allowed the devil to influence him in his own mind, and he overstressed the doctrine of predestination. He began to criticize uh, Pastor Falwell for offering invitation. Uh, just as a uh, missionary, uh, just as uh, a man had done when uh, uh, William Carey, I believe, stood up in a prayer meeting and said, I feel God has called me to the mission field and gave his testimony. And an elderly deacon stood up and said, young man, when God gets ready to save the heathen, he'll do it without your help or mine, you see, because what's going to be is going to be. And there's nothing we can do about it, and it's ridiculous. We might as well just sit down and fold our hands and God let God do it all. And we had to uh, encourage that student to leave. So one of the reasons, uh, one of the ways Satan certainly likes to, to get back at believers is by overstressing one side of a doctrine. Then another on the other side of this thing is he often understresses certain doctrines. And perhaps one of the great biblical doctrines played down today is the doctrine of the local church. Um, some time ago, well, of course, in Dallas Seminary, we took courses in church history, and it's been a long time since I've studied, made any study of church history. But I do know that in the study of uh, the history of the church, and churches, from the first century on to the 20th century, you can sort of pinpoint uh, there's a pattern, the devil's attack. Uh, he'll attack one doctrine. Of course, he, he's always attacking them all, but he'll zero in on one doctrine. He'll declare an all-out war on one precious doctrine and go after it with all that he's worth. And then uh, when he's defeated there, he'll uh, lay low for a while and attack another. For example, the first few centuries, it was the doctrine of the deity of Christ. Was Christ the Son of God, or was he a Son of God? And, of course, uh, they had a council in the 325 A.D., the Council of Nicaea, and they went on record as declaring that the Bible taught that Jesus Christ was not a Son of God, but was the Son of God. So he attacked the doctrine of the deity of Christ for a while, and then he didn't hit that quite as hard. And then later on, 
Well, there are many other uh, examples I could give you, but of course, about the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries, he uh, began to attack the doctrine of justification by faith and, and the uh, right of the priest to forgive sins. And, and so Martin Luther and, and uh, a number of others uh, then were led by God to straighten out believers concerning uh, this erroneous concept of what justification is all about. The just shall live by faith. And uh, then later on, actually at the turn of the 19th century, he began to attack the doctrine of the inspiration of the Bible. Now, he still does that today, but I mean, he, uh, you know, fundamentalism, conservatism fought the battle of the Bible, as it were, in the late 1900s and the early years of the 20th century. And, and entire denominations were fighting uh, this battle of, uh, of the Bible. And uh, today, though, he's apparently uh, aimed all his big guns at the doctrine of the local church. And he's either denying it or he's absolutely downplaying it to the extent where that uh, many believers are caught up in this. And they feel that the, the very concept of a local church is an erroneous concept. I mean... That is to say, it sort of went out with high button shoes. And I, and I read an article some time ago. It said, you know, you even look at the, at the time, and that sort of is outdated. Uh, most church worship services take place at 11 o'clock in the morning. Now, you see, the reason being, a number of years ago, uh, men, farmers, would milk at about, uh, uh, you know, 7 o'clock in the morning, and then they would uh, milk again about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And so between 7 and 3, the milking periods, as it were, twice a day, uh, uh, 11 o'clock fell in. That was about halfway through. And, and so this was convenient for them. But it's certainly not to be patterned after today. And, uh, well, in your notes you have my article, I uh, once wrote a fire with the devil. And I'll read it here to you now. If I were the devil, I would turn to that most despised and deadly institution of all, the local church. I would continue to attack it from the outside just to keep in practice, but would con concentrate, uh, concentrate the bulk of my evil efforts from within. In other words, I'd join the church. I'd walk forward and apply for church membership, you see, if I were the devil. The church is dead would become my creed and cry. If I were the devil, I would do my utmost to convince professing Christians that the local church is finished. Not weak, not ineffective, but dead and actually decaying. I would encourage them to dig a hole, carve an epitaph, and bury it as quietly and quickly as possible. Christianity could then proceed to new glories where cell groups would replace Sunday nights and sermons would be set aside for buzz sessions. Oh, how Satan has worked this. I, I have a close friend, if I would mention his name, and I certainly will not because I do not doubt his love for the Lord or his salvation. Now, if I'd mention his name, practically every single a listener to this tape would immediately recognize the name. And some time ago, in another state, I had lunch with him, spent the day with him, and he said, you know, and on this occasion, this several years ago, I was pastoring a church. He said, you know, Wilmington, he said, I'm, I'm glad God's called you to pastor and not me. And I said, well, you know, he calls uh, different men to do different things. And so I didn't think much about it, but he came back to it again a little later, and he said, like I say, he said, I'm glad I don't have to depend upon my living uh, the tithes and offerings of a local church. I'm glad God didn't call me into this ministry. And I said, uh, now, wait a minute. I said, you know, you've made a comment several times. I said, you know, there's a lot of heartaches in the ministry, but I've been in it a number of years, and God is blessed. I said, why do you, uh, you know, why do, do you have something in your mind it would cause you to you know back of your mind to cause you to make that statement and he's very frank with me he said well he said I he said I don't doubt your sincerity but he said I believe that God is now bypassing the local church he said I think he worked with it for a while 
But he said now, you know, mass evangelism and, and uh, other uh, sharing groups and dialogue conversations and, and all these other things uh, that have uh, rap sessions that have, you know, come into being recently. He said, I feel that uh, God, that's where the real action is. And I'm glad I'm a part of that world and not the dead and decaying world of local churches, the Sunday morning 11 a.m. worship service. And oh, what an attack the devil is making on local churches. He's minimizing the doctrine of the local church. All right, now, another thing that Satan does. We've seen how he overemphasizes, he underemphasizes, he perverts, he misinterprets, he takes out of context, he hinders, and he sows... Uh, or I'm, I'm going to speak about hinders now. He sows uh, tares and God's uh, wheat among God's wheat, and he imitates God. Now, uh, the next thing that he does, he hinders the work of God's servants. And I think as believers, we often underestimate the power of Satan. Satan can cause the believer, at least temporarily, uh, not to do that work that uh, God would have him do. Not that God is powerless, but this world is in the hands of the evil one, and Jesus told a group of disciples on one occasion who could not cast out an evil demon, evil spirit, this cometh not, this kind cometh not out except by prayer and fasting. For example, the Apostle Paul says to the Thessalonican believers, Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but Satan hindered us. Now, I don't know how else you can interpret that verse. I believe in the sovereignty of God, and I believe had God wanted Paul badly enough to go, he would have gone. But I take Paul's statement at face value. He said, I wanted to visit you, Thessalonians, and the reason I didn't get there is that Satan hindered me. So he can and does hinder the work of God's servants. And uh, on occasion, uh, the believer cannot understand this. And uh, the believer says, uh, you know, uh, here I'm doing work for the Lord and I'm being uh, hindered. And sometimes we have students that do this. We have students that uh, come to the Thomas Road Bible Institute and uh, they say, you know, Dean Wilmington, uh, I just can't understand it. Uh, before I came here, I, uh, we didn't have any real financial problems and, and uh, no family pressures and had a good job and a nice home. And then we sold out and came to Thomas Road. And, uh, you know, since we've been here, we've uh, had uh, all kinds of problems and family pressures and never had the financial uh, uh, you know, problems that we've had since we've been here. And, uh, I, of course, I encourage them along this line that they've taken a, they've taken a stand against the, uh, the Lord, uh, against the devil. They've taken a stand for the Lord. And, you know, Satan's going to, uh, of course, uh, he's not going to go along with this. And it's just like a soldier, you know, uh, he trains for a few months and then he goes overseas and the bullets are uh, going around his head, and you know, he says, man alive, a guy could get killed out here. Uh, well, they didn't shoot at me back in basic training in Texas. Well, of course not. He's taking a stand for the Lord and against the devil, and the devil frowns on that. So we are to expect the hindering ministry of the devil if we're going to work for the Lord. So he hinders the work of God's servants. And then he resists the prayers of God's servants. Sometimes prayers are hindered by satanic activity. There are times when we don't understand this either. And I prayed prayers and I thought they were sincere. And I thought that's what God wanted me to pray. And I didn't get any answer. And so for a while I would blame it on the transmitter. I would say, well, it's my fault. I didn't have enough faith or I didn't ask the right kind of prayer. And, uh, but then sometimes I've had a tendency to blame God. I said, well, maybe it's not the fault of the transmitter, it's the fault of the receiver. God should have listened, and, and God just didn't mean it when he said he'd answer my prayers. But as we study, especially the book of Daniel, chapter 10, uh, we find that on occasion, 
Prayers are hindered not because of a defective transmitter or because of an unfaithful receiver, but because of interference on the line. Sometimes the message is interfered. And um, Daniel had been praying for some 21 days and fasting and pouring his heart out before God. And then we read these words in verse 12. An angel refer, uh, comes to Daniel and he says, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Well, I don't know what Daniel thought, but I know what I would have thought. I thought, well, now, wait a minute. Where have you been the last 21 days? I mean, you know, uh, you've been uh, messing around in another part of the universe. Here I've been praying and seeking God, and, and if God sent you immediately upon hearing this prayer, where have you been? And, uh, of course, uh, he doesn't have to wonder very long because the angel answers even verse 13. Uh, but the prince of the kingdom, he said, of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. In other words, he said, I uh, started to come down. You see, because angels are the ministering spirits to the heirs of salvation. We're told that in the book of Hebrews. God sent me to answer your prayer. But you know how Satan works, and he has this world organized, and and so one of his cohorts, one of his five-star generals, attempted to stop me, and I really couldn't get through. And so I had to call upon Michael, our five-star general. I had to call upon uh, Michael, the archangel, and uh, he helped me battle through to help you. Well, now, wait a minute, Wilmington. Can we really take this literally? Well, I don't know how else we take it. If we can't take it literally, that's what the Bible says. And we need to understand that God... Uh, always answers all faithful prayers that he hears from believers. But sometimes there is a delay. It's a delay that God allows and that God permits. But it is a delay caused by satanic interference, static on the line. And you need to, you need to understand that the next time you pray. Satan resists the prayers of God's servants. And we know how that works, of course, anyway. Uh, you decide you're going to pray at 7 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I don't care what time it is. That will be the time when you'll be the busiest and uh, when everything, it seems, uh, that uh, you didn't expect to happen will happen. Because Satan, the old poem has said, poet has said, Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. He resists the prayers of God's servant. And then another thing Satan does, of course, he blinds men to the truth. Some time ago, a person when I was in the pastor came to me and said, you know, pastor, I can't understand my unsaved neighbor. I mean, the man's home, I've witnessed to him, and the man's home is literally breaking up before his eyes. His children are becoming rebellious, and his wife is threatening to divorce him. He's uh, rapidly becoming an alcoholic. He's about to lose his job. They're talking of foreclosing on his home. And uh, his very sanity is being affected. And he's just beside himself. And yet I've witnessed to him, and, and he just can't see that he needs Christ. Well, of course he can't. You see, because Satan blinds men to the truth. When we go out witnessing, we need to keep in mind that we are witnessing to insane, deaf, and blinded men and women. Now, thank God, God can set all this aside, but Satan blinds men to the truth. I say insane because sin makes a man insane. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, Paul speaks of this, "...in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is in the image of God, should shine unto them." Let me just stop here and say, when we discuss the doctrine of the Bible, I'll get into the three steps of Bible uh, from God to man. Number one is Bible, it's Revelation. 
And that's uh, God giving the message in the first place. And that's the next uh, step is inspiration. And that's God guiding the pen of the man as he writes it down. And the third step is illumination. And that's the Holy Spirit taking the inspired word and applying it to human hearts. And you have to have that third step. Uh, if there was no Satan, if human minds were not blinded, it would be the most normal, rational, logical thing for a sinner on his way to hell to accept Christ. But all you would need then would be revelation and inspiration. But you have to have illumination because of satanic blindness as far as men are concerned. All right, and then another thing the devil does, he steals the word of God from human hearts. I remember uh, my second pastorate in Ohio, and a young woman had been housewife, had been attending the services regularly, and I had noticed her, and she was unsaved, and I'd been witnessing to her, and she wasn't quite ready to accept Christ, but she was taking notes, and we're going through the book of Revelation, really enjoying it. Then I missed her one Sunday, and and uh, that she wasn't uh, back the next Sunday. So I called on her that week and, and uh, didn't catch her home. And then finally I uh, sent somebody else to check on her, and they came and said, you know, she's, uh, she's not coming back. And I said, well, what's wrong? Is she sick? Is she, is she moving? Is she attending another church? They said none of these, uh, that uh, she was sick for one week, and, and uh, or somehow she did not come to our church and... She was visited by uh, some people from the Watch Tire Society, and she got involved in that, and now she's uh, becoming a member of the Kingdom Hall uh, group, uh, the Jehovah Witness group. He steals the Word of God from human hearts. For three Sundays in a row, I had the opportunity to begin to plant the seed of salvation that would lead to salvation in the woman's heart. But you see, the devil then stole that word before it had a chance to bring forth fruit. And of course, this is what Jesus meant in Matthew 13, verse 19. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, or receiveth it not actually, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. And so he steals the word of God from human hearts. And then, and we've already discussed this, but one of the great ministries of the devil today is accusing Christians before God. Some have asked me, do you think that the devil actually tempts people? Now, I know he can, but does he waste time on the average person? I doubt if he does. In fact, I doubt if he does much tempting at all. Now, I know he does on occasion to keep in practice, I suppose. He tempted David in the Old Testament to sin against God. And then the New Testament, he tempted Ananias and Sapphira to lie to the Holy Spirit. He tempted Simon Peter to deny Christ. And uh, he was uh, involved in uh, tempting the Apostle Paul. He hindered Paul, as we said. But I think uh, Satan probably delegates most of the tempting business that goes on today to his cohorts, the demons. I think Satan's priority, Satan's main job is uh, accusing Christians at the right hand of God the Father. I think that's what he works on hardest. And we do know that he accuses believers. He has access to the very right hand of the Father. The book of Job tells us this, Job chapter 1, Job chapter 2. The book of Zechariah, chapter 3, refers to Satan being at the right hand of the Father. And then, of course, Revelation, chapter 12. And so he accuses, and while we're listening to these tapes, while we're making the tapes, while you're taking the test, while you're eating your food and driving your car and going about your daily activities of life, Satan, who never slumbers, who never sleeps, is continuously at work before the right hand of the Father, uh, making intercession against the believer and attempting to slander the child of God. And the tragic thing is this, as I've often said, sometimes he doesn't even have to exaggerate. He simply tells it the way it is. He'll say, do you know Mary Brown or Bob J uh, Bob Smith, and they claim to be saved. And do you know what they did last week? He accuses believers before the right hand of the Father. And then another thing that Satan does, 
He loves to do this. He lays snares for men. There's a little poem that goes, When the danger least thou fearest, then the tempter's snare is nearest. And Paul warns Timothy to warn other members of the church concerning this. He says, uh, You warn them that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. And often the child of God becomes careless and flippant and, and he feels, uh, you know, I've passed the point of being sna ensnared by this sin. And um, let me just stop and say this, that I don't think there's a week that goes by, certainly not a month that goes by at Thomas Road, that we, I do not personally hear from other people who go out and speak in churches or from Jerry or, or the rest. I do not hear of a pastor uh, who has fallen from grace, as it were. He's been guilty of immorality with a woman or he's stolen money. Or some, in some way he's disgraced the name of Christ. I think uh, once a month we hear uh, at Thomas Road about somebody that has done this across our nation. And many of these men are older men. In fact, most of them are. Every now and then you hear of a young fellow who will do something like this. But I'm thinking of several older men now that have done this out of the ministry, had successful pastorates. I'm thinking of a man now who is in prison charged with defrauding the church that he once pastored of some forty to fifty thousand dollars. Now, I wonder why this often happens to older men. Men that have been in the ministry, you would think they were the strongest. You can understand when the younger ones, but what about the mature? When the buck privates fall, that's one thing. But what about the five-star generals? Now, I think the reason is that sometimes uh, age brings on uh, carelessness, <clears throat> and we feel that we are above certain things, we'll never be tempted to do those things. Do you know that the Bible is filled with instances where men fail God in their strong points and not their weak points? We've discussed this before, but let me stop and review it. For example, Elijah the prophet. We'll just skip around here. Elijah's great source of strength. Uh, was uh, his boldness. Here he single-handedly, this bold, fearless prophet, stands up single-handedly against 450 priests of Baal in 1 Kings 18. And what a fearless uh, Billy Sunday he was in the Old Testament. And yet in 1 Kings 19, we see him running for his life from a woman, a man who stood up against 450 men now uh, runs like a frightened puppy from a woman. He failed God in his strong point. I think of a man like Moses. If you would analyze the life of Moses and be asked to pick out his strongest characteristic, I'm sure if you read the account carefully, it would be his meekness. In fact, the Bible says that, that the man Moses was a meek man. He was the meekest man on earth. Now, he wasn't a weak man, but he was a weak man. I mean, he was a meek man. That means he had sustained strength. He didn't blow his cool. He, uh, he controlled his emotions. He was a meek man. And yet, he was guilty of a sin that kept him out of the promised land. What was that sin? The sin of anger, which is the antithesis, the opposite of meekness. And we think of a man called David. His two outstanding characteristics was, was his purity. Here's a man who wrote the 23rd Psalm. Here's a man after God's own heart. And his kindness. Uh, David refused on a number of occasions to kill his enemies. He refused to kill Saul. On another occasion, he refused to kill a man named Shemai. Another case, he refused to kill a man named Nabal. All these were ungodly men that deserved to be killed, but David, his kindness forbade him to kill them. And he said, God forbid, in matters of Saul, he said, God forbid that I should touch God's anointed. And yet David fails God in matters of adultery and murder, the opposite of kindness and the opposite of purity. Now, we could go on and on. The reason being, I think these men, perhaps were uh, more uh, concerned with their weak points than their strong points. And, uh, you know, we hear the expression, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. 
And uh, so they probably realize I have certain problems in these areas and uh, I'll be on guard, but I don't have to worry about these others. Well, Satan, uh, he uh, goes around back and he comes in the back door and he hits us in the strong things of our life, things that we just feel we'd never do in a million years. What I'm trying to say is that what Satan does, he lays snares for the feet of believers, unsuspecting believers, careless believers. And then, and we've discussed this so many times, Satan tempts. God tests with the idea of making better, as a goldsmith would test the fire by purifying it in the fire. Uh, but the devil tempts, he entices people to do evil. And by the way, it is no sin to be tempted. In fact, uh, it's a tragedy if you claim to be a child of God and you're not tempted. And that simply means that you're so worthless in Satan's sight that he doesn't even give the command for one of his cohorts to tempt you. A lot of people feel if they're tempted to do certain things, then this means that, that uh, they're not as close to God as they should be. Well, one of the greatest temptation accounts of all time, of course, occurs in Matthew 4 when Satan tempts the Lord Jesus. It is not a sin to be tempted. In fact, the Bible says that we are to rejoice in the hour, in the midst of temptation, because God is going to allow us to suffer for Christ and to purify us through the fire of temptation. But tempt he does. And then he afflicts. We've already discussed this somewhat. The devil can oppress believers. He cannot possess believers as I understand the Bible. He can oppress believers uh, both uh, mentally and emotionally and I believe physically. We know he afflicted Job with boils. We know he afflicted, we've discussed this before, a woman in Luke 13, um, for 18 years, we know he afflicted the Apostle Paul. And uh, in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, Simon Peter reminds his listeners of this. He says, How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. So the devil can oppress the believer, physically, emotionally, and mentally. And then the devil deceives. Revelation 12, verse 9, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. I remember years ago I was uh, driving my car uh, through uh, western Missouri, I was listening to a radio, and I didn't get the name of the pastor or the name of the program, but he was preaching a message on the Matthew 13, and he also quoted Revelation 12 about the sower and the seed and the, and the deceiving that's going on today. It's one of the best sermons that I ever heard, and, and he brought across so many uh, just wonderful points and his illustrations and everything that that uh, as I remember, this happened a number of years ago, but as I remember, I think I pulled the car over and got out a pencil and paper and wrote down some of the thoughts he had because it was just fantastic. And I, and I just determined right then I was going to listen to uh, who he was and find out his name and write in and see if he had any other sermons in print. And imagine my amazement at the end of the program that said, now, friends, this program has been brought to you under the auspices of the reorganized church of the Latter-day Saints as a group of Mormons, actually, in independent Missouri there. And here I uh, at least prided myself uh, at knowing something about the Bible, and, and yet until I knew the source of that information that I was getting, I was deceived in thinking that he was a, a Bible believer. Uh, you can listen to Garner Ted Armstrong on radio or watch him on television. And, of course, actually what he does at times is simply summarize the uh, U.S. News and World Report and Time Magazine and Newsweek and all that. But much of what he says is true as, as far as he goes. But, of course, he's one of probably the world's greatest uh, deceivers uh, today. 
And uh, he's one of the most popular preachers in the world today, too, I'm sorry to say. But the devil loves to deceive. Dr. Wilbur Smith, uh, the late Dr. Smith, I think in one of his books I read a few years ago, I believe I'm quoting this right, he says that some uh, five out of six times you read the word deceive in the Bible, in the Greek New Testament, is a reference to the activities of Satan in the latter days of the world's history before the rapture and second coming takes place. So we see this deception today. And of course, the reason for the deception is that men do not know the word of God. He deceived the Pharisees into uh, believing many blasphemous things and saying many blasphemous things about Christ. And our Lord, and they were mixed up on various things, the Sadducees uh, also were mixed up on things like the resurrection, and they uh, denied it and asked him a question. And our Lord said, Ye do err, not knowing the Scripture. And so if one does not know the Word of God, he is automatically deceived by the devil, whether he's saved or unsaved, I should say. All right, and then he undermines the sanctity of the home. 1 Corinthians 7, we're told that, and uh, the word, by the way, the word fasting is often mentioned in the Bible. A uh, person can fast. It means to do without something. It does not necessarily mean to do without food. Often we take it that that's limited to that meaning, but it can mean without sleep. Or in this case, uh, 1 Corinthians 7, Paul speaks very uh, in a detailed way here, uh, a person can fast in matters of sex. <clears throat> On occasion, husbands and wives may feel it necessary <clears throat> to give themselves over to, uh, to not uh, having the normal sex relationship uh, in the family because they need to pray and fast. And uh, this is what he means in verse 5, Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that you may enter, <clears throat> may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your lack of sexual uh, intimacy. That's actually what Paul is saying here. And the point that we attempt to make here is that uh, often problems in a home are caused not basically because of a cold, uh, uh, not understanding um, husband, or because of a frigid wife, or because of uh, children, or financial problems, but sometimes problems are caused in homes because of satanic activity. And I mentioned this uh, when we began these lectures, that the counselor ought to keep in mind when he listens to homes of people coming and talking to him that perhaps the problem is satanic. Now, often it is not, I know. Sometimes it is a fault of the husband or it's a fault of the wife or maybe it's fault of both. And sometimes there are financial things and health reasons involved, but sometimes the fault must lie 100% at the feet of Satan. He hinders domestic tranquility. At least he attempts uh, to do that. Well, it was Satan, of course, that caused David to disobey God in the Old Testament. It was Satan that caused Judas to betray Christ in the Gospel account. And it was Satan that caused Simon Peter to rebuke Christ and later to deny him. And it was Satan in the book of Acts who caused Ananias to lie to the Holy Spirit. All right, now I'm going to stop here by reviewing uh, what we've said thus far, and then the next few tapes will take the geographical locations of Satan. He's like a check forger. He's going to move around quite a bit. He doesn't pay his rent. He's always moving around. The limitations of Satan. Thank God he is not uh, omnipresent. He is not omniscient. He is not omnipotent and then the believer's victory over Satan. Thus far, though, we have looked at his existence, his origin, his personality, his names, and his activities.